1958. And this was just recently. These are, this was just recently when I was speaking here. Hmm. This year. These. See, I get to speak. Uh, there's a group um, uh, that have they have a meeting. They've been coming here for 20 years. So when it's Easter time, they ask me to do the message. Christmas time, they ask me to do the message. Yeah. started on this. <laughs> yeah. I'll be here all night. Yeah. Just to have to put this on the yeah, table. Put it on the table. Right yeah. Uh, here, come over this side so you can see it. This is an album that I put together about our ministry. This was a church in uh, uh, Pekin, Illinois. And who's playing the who's playing the instrument? My brother, my brother. That's him? Yeah. Where are you at? I'm here. And that's you singing. That's one with my wife. So yeah. the three of you together. Yes. Oh, that's sweet. And yeah. And okay. But there's well and let's see. I I'll just yeah. let you go through. Okay. Ah, I'm Ralph Sutera. I'm one of the Sutera twins. I have a twin brother who is 10 minutes older than I am, and I'm 10 minutes smarter than he is, so it means we're even. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, actually, uh, Lou and I were raised in New, New Jersey. We were born in Brooklyn, New York, raised in New Jersey. And um, as an Italian family, you know that it was a very religious family. And um, in that religious um, background, it was not conducive for us to understand what the gospel message was really all about. It was a matter of churchianity rather than Christianity. And uh, uh, our family was strong in the midst of a religious system, but the reality of a living Christ was not there. But when mother and dad met the Lord personally, and that's a wonderful story of how that all happened, well, when Mother found the Lord in a most unique way, Dad was ready to leave her with five children and said, Mother, as much as I love you, I, I can't stand you doing this to my religion and our family background. We cannot have that. And he was furious, and he was a wonderful family man. But to touch the religion, that was more than Mother could handle. And so in the midst of all that, he got to the place and said, Mother, what can I do to prove that I love you in spite of what you're doing to me? And that was go to church. And uh, as a result, Mother would go to the church service and she would get a hold of one of the men and say, my husband is going to be picking me up from church this morning. Why don't you come out and say a word to him? Good morning, Mr. Sotero. It's a wonderful morning today. But it's wonderful, wonderful to know that if this were to be your last day in the world, you're ready to go straight to heaven. Good day. And then the prayer meeting night, mother would be there. Dad would come to pick her up. Good evening, Mr. Stair. So nice to have you. It's wonderful to know that you have the assurance of salvation and that to know that your sins are all forgiven. Good night. Good evening. Nice to have you here. Well, Dad got so miserable in the process that he figured he'd have to get a, have, make a bargain with mother. So the bargain was, you've got to go to church with me. So she figured, he said, well, if I have to do it, I'll go on a Tuesday night when they have a Bible study. And it's down in the basement of the church. It's not like going into the main sanctuary. And so that's where, where it happened. He said, Mother, you go in first. I'll sit down. And after everybody's there, I'll come in, sneak in, sit on the back row. And then I'll leave before anybody leaves and so nobody will see me nobody will talk to me well he started out with good intentions but what happened was god had that pastor speaking in such a way that my dad realized that the very thing that had happened to our mother was the very thing that man was talking about and she he saw the change what happened in mother and so here he was listening and all at once when the pastor got finished speaking my dad forgot that that was his cue to get up and leave. <laughs> Instead, he finds himself at the altar. 
And he said, God, would you please, please give me what my wife has? And there he opened his heart and was genuinely born again. And as a result of that, our whole family was transformed. Dad became a tremendous witness he, he, in the grocery business. Um, he just shared his faith with so many customers. He, there was a, a store called Sutera Brothers Italian American Groceries, and it was our family store. In fact, mother and dad and my uncle, they had the idea that one day all of us as five children, three on our side and two on my uh, uncle's side, that we would have our own chain store, Sutera Brothers Grocery, in the New, New Jersey area. But God saw fit to change that and called all three of us out of it into the ministry. But interesting, when Dad was converted to Christ in such a personal way, it was amazing that the change was so real. Why, when customers would come in, many would come in on Monday morning after being at their church, their Italian church on Sunday, and they'd be talking about their religion and what, what went on, what they liked and what they didn't like from what was being said. And one of the men who's working with us, who was not, he was a nominal religious person, but never going to church, he would stop them in the midst of the conversation. And he would say, no, 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 in Italian, he would give it to them, no, 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 no. When, when I get religion, this is what he would say, when I get religion, I don't want your kind, I don't want your kind. He said, you see my boss, talking about my dad. He said, that's the kind I want, because I saw the tremendous change that came about in his life. Yeah. And he began to tell about the change. That's the kind I want. Mm. So in the midst of all of this, the change in my dad's life was so powerful. Well, what happened was, during the first year of my dad's conversion to Christ, we saw him bringing all kinds of his customers to a Sunday night service. And I still have a, a mental picture of seeing my dad right at the, on the doorsteps of the church, waiting for another one of his customers. Mm -hmm. As a result of all that, mother and dad started their own church. Here is a grocer by day and a minister preacher by night, and anywhere from 75 to 125 Italians that would come and were born again of God's Holy Spirit and understood the difference between merely having religion and having a personal relationship with Christ. Yeah. So that started in our family. In fact, it was there that Lou and I, my twin brother and I, had opportunities to exercise our, our gifts as far as playing our instruments and then doing a little speaking for mother and dad in the church as they were there ministering to them. And so that started it all. But Lou and I, we were rascals. Well, Mother said we fought like cats and dogs, but she never told us which one was the cat or which one was the dog. But I know because I got the worst end of it. Yeah. We had a line down the center of our bed. You couldn't see it, but it was there. <laughs> if he got his elbow over the middle of the line, we were in for an all-night fight. Mm -hmm. But Mother said to us, boys, you know, if you would just let Jesus come into your heart, he would put love in your heart, even enough love to love your twin brother. Now, I knew that was impossible because you don't know how mean he was. Yeah. <laughs> so, but actually, Mother would have us sing, Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And we get finished and Mother would say, Sing it again, boys. Into my heart, into, and we'll go through it again. We get finished, Mother would say, Sing it again, boys. Into my heart. It seemed like we sang it a hundred times to Mother. Mother wanted to make sure he was, <laughs> he was in. Yeah. But the story is that that was the first night two twin boys went to bed with their arms around each other and learned how to love each other. And that was when we were eight years of age. Mm. And when we were 10 and 11, we began gathering boys and girls in our neighborhood, in our basement on Saturday mornings, and sharing with them what God had done for us. And, uh, and also the fact that mother would make sure that we would have our personal devotions every day coming in from school. And we would hear the, the boys outside, Ralph, Lou, come on out, come on out. We're waiting to play ball, we're waiting to play ball. And here we are in our little closets for our devotions yeah. before it. 
And so we began to see that. The reality of the living God was so real in our home that mother would um, make sure that whenever any of uh, the salesmen would come, she would see to it that she would lock the door behind them. This is when you could have a salesman in your home and it wasn't dangerous. <laughs> so they would knock on the door, come on in, come on in. And she'd lock the door behind them so they couldn't have a fast getaway. <laughs> and many days we would see mother witnessing to a salesman. She would listen to their what they wanted to sell. She would time them. <laughs> And then she would say, all right, oh, well, well, if she wanted it, she would buy it. If she didn't need it, she'd let them know. Mm -hmm. And then she would say, uh, and they were about ready to leave. Say, no, 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 don't leave. No, don't leave. I've given you about 45 minutes of my time. And now I'm going to have 45 minutes of my time back by sharing with you the most important thing about my life. Mm -hmm. And... It was amazing to see how she would lead salespeople to the Lord. And we'd come in quietly, and sometimes we'd see them on their knees in our living room, praying together. And on the way out, Mother had a, there was a closet door, a closed closet right before you leave the house. And Mother would have a track rack in there. And she'd have a track for everybody. One for the Jehovah's Witness, one for the Mormons, one for this one, one for this one, one for the backslidden Christian, on and on, one for those who are lonely. And she would make sure that they got the word on the way out. Yeah. But it was interesting because some of them who got saved and gave their hearts to the Lord, she would have the follow-ups. So they'd come back uh, two weeks later, and here were mothers training them, teaching them the word of God. Okay, so that's what we saw. Yeah in a mother's life, in a dad's life. And all of that goes into why I'm here now. Right. To be able to say, hey, parents have so much to do with what happens to their children so often. Yeah. Now, it doesn't always turn out right, but it's wonderful to see the impact that can be made. And so, here we are. What happened? God uh, actually put his hand on us. When we were 17 years of age, we felt the call of God to preach. And we enrolled in Bible college and studied for the ministry. Started in having evangelistic meetings. And for 18 years, we traveled across the country having one week evangelistic crusades. And during that process, it was wonderful. We saw a number of people saved. And here's where Bob Kaplowitz comes into the picture. Right. Because it was, uh, we were there um, I believe it was March 29th through April the 5th, 1970, where Bob was in our meetings in Jamestown, North Dakota. And um, But you see, what happened going through this whole process, many times we would say, go back to a church where we'd had a week of special meetings, where we'd prayed with a lot of people to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, where are some of these people that we prayed with a year or two later? What happened to them? Yep. Where are they? Was there something wrong with our message? Was there something wrong with the people in the church that could not relate to new believers? Right. Um, was there something wrong with the pastoral leadership that didn't know how to carry people on? And in retrospect, in looking at that, I think maybe all three could be true. Right. And from our perspective, God began to deal with us. Right, uh, right about 1970, 71, shortly after we were with Bob, mm -hmm. about the message. And we began to see that um, the message we were preaching was wonderful for people to receive it like that, but why they could not go on. And we found that many of them came because they wanted to find out what's in it for us, what's in it for me. Right. Instead of what am I giving to the Lord who's already given everything for me. 
And God began to deal with us about the fact that we were preaching a kind of message that um, it's, uh, oh, I can't let me say it this way. It's um, come and get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. Right. What's in it for me? And God began to deal with us about that whole truth of full surrender to the Lordship of Christ. And when we understand who he is and what we are, nothing in ourselves, and now we want to give ourselves totally to him, and the message changed. Yeah. All at once we began to see a difference. Mm -hmm. And when we were in Prince George, British Columbia, a pastor said to us, he said, fellas, you know what you are beginning to preach? You're beginning to preach total commitment to Christ and you're beginning to preach death to the self-life to be filled with the Holy Spirit for the power of God to function through your life. And that's where the revival in Western Canada began as a result of all this, what I'm telling you. God transforming our ministry in a very powerful way as well as sharpening the message. When I st we studied for the ministry, um, we had a ministerial class of 1,100 fellows. Where were you at? Sorry, at, yes. at Bob Jones University is where we oh, studied, yes. Jones. Okay. Yes. Right. And at that time, there were 1,100 fellows studying for the ministry. Okay. And uh, all of us as ministerial students, we had to write a 15-minute doctrinal sermon for a sermon contest. And I happened to write a sermon on the subject of death, what the Bible says about death. And um, they, they would take the 200 best manuscripts. And then from the 200 best manuscripts, those fellows would have to memorize those messages word for word. And they then uh, in an elimination contest, six fellows in a room with a few faculty members judging, you'd have to preach that message. They take two out of every six, two out of every six, until they got down to about 18. And then they would take nine out of the 18. And then the next time, those nine had to preach their message, and they take three out of the nine, and those three would be considered the, the preacher boys, ministerial preacher boys contest finalists. And then you'd have to preach that message on graduation day in front of 3,000 people in the auditorium with outside judges. And then they would have one fellow would be the winner, and he gets a Bible as the winner. Well, so here I wrote this message on the subject of death. My brother, I forget what he wrote. I know he did one on the second coming. Well... He was knocked out of the contest, and uh, I found myself as one of the three finalists. And there we are, and guess who the judges were? Two of them. One was Ma Billy Sunday, Mrs. Billy Sunday. Another one was the late Dr. Clarence McCartney, who was President Eisenhower, late President Eisenhower's fat pastor from the Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. So those were two of the judges. And so here I am. Now, I was preaching on the subject of death. The other fellow, then we were all three were good friends. He was preaching on hell, and the third one was on judgment. <laughs> How, now, how's that for a hot night? Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So now you know I had to go first because you have to die first yeah. <laughs> before the rest can take place. Yeah. And so that's what happened. And I'll never forget what it was like. I'm preaching on the subject of death, and here's Ma Billy Sunday about six or seven rows down in front of me. She couldn't see in one eye and not too much in the other eye. But here she is shouting away, Amen! <laughs> Amen, amen, when I was preaching. And after we got done, she comes up to me and says, Brother Ralph, that message was just for me. I'm ready to go. She was in her 80s already. <laughs> she says, I'm ready to go. So I kind of think I got her vote. Yeah. What happened was they voted, six voted, and we each got two votes. Tie. So what did they do? Took the Bible, 
and cut it in three parts. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they went back to the manuscripts and the, so the um, English department and the Bible department people made a, a judgment on it and the fellow who preached on judgment was the winner. Now, why have I told you that? Just to say something nice about what I did? No. Merely to say that when we started in the ministry, my brother would sometimes do one or two or three messages to church people in a week of meetings. And then from there on, I would do the evangelistic preaching. And we got to the place that we would not only do preaching night after night, but we would do morning Bible studies. I would do from 10 to 12, and then I'd be praying with people into sometimes 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a few hours to get ready and go back to the evening service, and then we would give invitations and people would respond and we're in the prayer room praying with people. And then sometimes we even had sessions at home. People would go to their homes and put the coffee pot on and after the evening service and everything, we'd go and sometimes there till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning talking about what God was saying and ministering to people's needs. That's the way we got started in evangelism. And it was wonderful to see that happen. But do you know what happened? I was so loaded with self-centeredness and pride that I just knew that I was going to win the whole world to Christ myself. Mm. After all, I could preach, right? And in the midst of going on like that, well, I had a complete breakdown. Not a nervous breakdown, not an emotional breakdown, but exhaustion. The body just shut down. And I can tell you that for several weeks, I was flat on my back. Here we are, just starting in ministry. And here I'm the one that's going to win the world to Christ. And just think now, what's going to happen to this fabulous ministry that's going to shake the world? And now what's going to happen to our crusades now that they're going to have to listen to my brother preach? Oh! Oh! Yeah. My, in Italian. Mamma mia! Mamma mia! In Italian. And so here I am. He, he goes and has the meetings, I'm flat on my back in the bed. And I'm struggling with God over it. God, what a mistake you're making. This is awful. Just think, we'll, our whole ministry is going to ruin now. And I just, nothing would happen. I just kept fighting with it. And that went on for weeks like that. No voice, no energy, nothing. And it wasn't to the place until... I got to the place where I said, all right, God, it's no more my ministry, it's yours. All right, God, if I never preach another sermon again, it's all right. If all I do is carry the instruments, if all I do is make the announcements, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. It was not until I surrendered the rights to myself and my own ministry death to my own rights, that God began to touch me physically. And I would get up out of bed when this happened, go to the service, I would maybe make a couple announcements, and that's all the energy I had, I'd go back to bed. My brother had to do the meeting. Remember, we used to have a musical program. We'd sing duets, trios with my wife, chalk art work, I would give long dramatic readings. He had a vibra harp and accordion. We had two violins. We had the whole show, if I can say it this way, the, the religious show. Now, I don't want to belittle that because God used it. Right. But that was all a part of the preparation that God had for us. Why? Because by the time I could get back, when I get a little more energy, I would just... See, lead a few courses and then go back to bed. And in the midst of it, as it all came back, guess what? God was changing our ministry 
from a program orientation into teaching people how to worship and sing and participate and share their faith in a practical way, a personal application to all the truth. And that was all in preparation for what happened in Western Canada and the Canadian revival. God was doing it. And so as a result, it got to the place where because of our, 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 the ministries changed, I would have to do a lot of the organizing, the caring for the team. We had people traveling with us, all of the detail work that I would put up that all together. My brother was doing more of the preaching. I was doing the teaching sessions as well as the programming and all the rest of it. All of that was a part of God transforming it and getting us ready to be there where God saw fit to work in Prince George, British Columbia. And the pastor said, oh, fellas, I want you to know that my part in this ministry, you're here for 10 days. I have to pray. Don't ask me to do anything. God has told me I have to pray. If you need to know anything, you talk to the associates. They'll work out all the details with you. And that pastor would sit on the platform night after night for those first 10 days or so with very somber, very sober, very quiet. And one night, about 10 days into it, he comes to the platform and he said to the congregation, he said, folks, I just want you to know that God spoke to me last night. And he said, all right, my child, I've answered your prayers. Now rejoice. He was like a, a bird let out of the cage. And it was interesting to see that happen because when that happened, we did not know that that pastor for one solid year had not slept through one night without God wakening him to pray for revival for Canada. Night after night. And now he's seeing, and that was marvelous to see what happened in Prince George, British Columbia. That preceded what happened in Saskatoon in the large revival. And as a result, we would go from Prince George to Saskatoon, and we said, Cliff Dietrich, would you mind coming and joining us? There was a, a pastor's conference that was going on right as we were coming into the city. Will you come and talk to the pastors? And he came right from that, and God used him powerfully to encourage those pastors to go back to their churches in Saskatchewan and bring the people to Saskatoon to get involved. And that was the beginning of what happened for seven and a half weeks. What started with 190 people, we ended up on Grey Cup Sunday in October in Canada, which is like Super Bowl Sunday here, with 4,000 people in the, grand, in the large auditorium in the city, right in the middle of the biggest snowstorm imaginable, but you, we couldn't stop the people. So starting in that Baptist church, but you talk about what brings about a revival, it's the prayer ministry. The pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, for five years he had been on his knees. The fact of the matter is, he thought maybe his people would not allow him to continue as pastor because he was so involved in praying every day, every day for a revival. Early in the mornings, in the study, praying for revival. Then he was praying with some of the other pastors. And one of the pastors that he was praying with is a well-known pastor to Southern Baptist, and that's Henry Blackaby from the Blackaby Ministries. And here he was there. And that's where we met Henry Blackaby, and how God touched Henry Blackaby's life through that revival meeting. And how God then enlarged his ministry. And it expanded all through Western Canada. And Bill McLeod's ministry, the pastor of this church where this all started. How his ministry was expanded. And he was going all over the place. And it just, it just mushroomed to the place that everybody was calling. And... Lou and I had our schedule all lined up for two years. Now, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Right. That's wonderful. Look, 
pride. Yeah. Just think we're so busy, we're so important. See, and we would go to a church for a crusade and here, just about when God was ready to do something after a week at the church, we're leaving because we've got to go to the next place. Right. See? And we and God began to deal with us about that. Whose ministry is this? Whose schedule is it? And as a result of that, we we recognized that instead of building faith, we were destroying faith. People had prayed for God to do something, and just about the time God is ready to break through, here we are off to someplace else. And God dealt with us about that. And so we sat down and took our whole schedule for two years and erased it. Wrote to all the pastors, sorry, we're just going to follow what God wants us to do, wherever it leads, we're going to follow. And we got one letter back from a pastor in Ohio. We thought surely we were, he was going to really let us have it because we were going to be a part of a one week of a whole month of a celebration of a, I don't know, it was a 25th year or 50th year, I forget which it was, something like that. And we were going to be in that. Right. And here, he, an airmail special delivery letter back, we're canceling. And this was just a couple months before that was to happen. Mm -hmm. When that came, I said to my brother, I said, Lou, you, you open this letter. I don't want to open this one. No. I thought we were really going to get scolded. But instead, it was a tremendous release and a, a confirmation that what we were doing was right. When that pastor wrote, said, oh, I'm so glad to hear what's going on in Canada. It's wonderful to know that, that there are some... some people in ministry who are willing to give their ministry back to God and let God run it instead of running it themselves. He said, and if you can come to us at a later date, fine, wonderful, wonderful indeed. Confirmation that he knew that if God's on the scene, we're not just going to run off. And so for months, we went from one city to the next to the next, all through Western Canada. And, 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 and people were calling and, and then the other uh, uh, pastors from Saskatoon, they were going as well. It was just spreading all over. And that's where the book Flames of Freedom by Erwin Lutzer, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, wrote the book Flames of Freedom, telling the story of this revival. Okay, you know, I could go on and on with this. Well, Erwin Lutzer, he was the pastor of the, uh, the Edgewater Baptist Church in northern Chicago about 130 people in church because he was teaching at Moody Bible Institute right. and then pastoring this church on the side. So he goes home for the Christmas holidays to Western Canada only to find all these people that he knew, family as well as friends, who had met God in the revival, whose lives were transformed spiritually. And here he on his knees in one of those homes in Western Canada during the Christmas holidays, he surrenders his life totally to the Lord in a very real and powerful way. And he goes back to Chicago and he shares with his church what happened. And there were about 30 people on a Sunday morning on their knees just weeping before God. And a revival broke out in his church like that. And through the years, Erwin Lutzer has been very close to us. And we're in touch constantly and and, uh, and it's just wonderful to see how God touched his life and the ministry God's given him around the world. And Henry Blackaby, the ministry God gave him on the 30th year anniversary of this revival. We had a conference in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and Henry Blackaby was one of our speakers. And um, uh, after he got finished that night, I just felt as if something was still missing. Before, I said, Henry, when he got finished, I said, Henry, let me just talk to you a little bit. Right. See, because I've been with him a number of times in uh, ministry in Africa and other times, and I knew something about his life. I said, tell these folks what really happened in revival here in this city 30 years ago, how it transformed your ministry. And he's telling, and I interviewed him for almost an hour, and it was wonderful. And he said to me, he said and to everybody, he said, 
If I had to summarize what the revival has done in my life, I would probably have to say my whole DNA for life was changed as a result of that revival. My family was changed, ministry was changed, everything about it was changed as a result of that. And that's where his course on experiencing God came. In 1998, he came out with that. He said, did you realize it took me this long? Now, see, it was in 1971 when this happened. Right. 1998, Experiencing God came out, and that, all of that was basically the direct result of a revival that took place in his heart and in his life. It goes on like that. Yeah. All kinds of people whose lives and ministry were transformed by the power of God. So here we are. In the midst of it. Why do I say this is important? Because it started from the fact of going back to churches and wondering where are the people that we prayed with? Yeah. So many of them not around. And I can tell you that when God began to work at this deeper level and the message was deepened to full surrender, the Lordship of Christ, death to the self-life, to walk in the fullness of God's power, the difference is like night is today. Around the world, people are now whose lives were touched by that kind of a message that will never be the same again. And so their ministries have taken off. People have, there used to be a time where my brother used to preach one message in every crusade on the subject of surrender to full uh, surrender to full time ministry to young people. When God began to work in our hearts in revival, we don't preach that message anymore. No. We just said no, no. It's a full surrender to the lordship of Christ that will then He will determine where you're supposed to be because of that surrender. Right. And you know what we found before. There would be teenagers that would say, all right, all right, I'll go. That had all kinds of decisions they had to make. Yeah. Life partner, school, education, everything about them. When God worked in revival, guess what? Married couples, older people, God laying his hand on them. You can die on a mission field just as easy as you can in the United States. Surrender. All kinds of missionaries now fact of the matter is, there was a station in Africa, four different sets of missionaries were the direct result of the Canadian revival. Mm. Answering the call as adults yeah. to surrender. So you see, that's the difference right. of what a personal, what revival ministry is all about. And that's what we need in America yeah. to get back to the cross with a sob in our hearts. And where in most of our churches, our church leadership, what are they doing? What new program can we find? What, what, what do we, can we do to generate some energy yeah. in our church? And you know what God begins to show us? That it's the Holy Spirit that generates the energy. And when the Holy Spirit generates the energy, then watch. There's no stopping. He knows exactly where to put every individual. Yeah. See? Yeah. And then you don't have to look for a new program. It's amazing. People will say, oh, the Lord is leading me to do this. The Lord is directing me here. Why? Because they're walking in the fullness of the Spirit. There's a record of yours? Yes. Yeah. You all have records? We have one here. I have, I have one here. This is it. It was a long playing album. Oh, wow. And our singing. <laughs> nice. And do you see? And there's some of the pictures. See, there's in Barbados. Yeah. You don't have a record and, player, do you? Yeah. Yeah, we do. I think it, it will play in that machine there. Hmm. Are you able to put it on hmm? without too much effort? I've never. Effort? I, I have not used it. Somebody gave us this and I have not used it yet. Oh, I don't know if it'll work, but... Yeah, it, it, it should work. Okay. That's, uh, there was our mentor in the ministry. 
when we were seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was training us in ministry. Mm -hmm. And here we are in a radio studio or something. Here we had twin night on the island. 3,500 people in the grandstands. Barbados. Yeah, this is when he was playing just a straight accordion. He then went from this to an accordion, which is a combination of accordion and an organ together. If you could get him, he's got it over. Does there. he have one? He's okay. Got a, I'll have to tell him to get it out. If he play it, that'd be sweet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's something else. Huh. It's almost like a whole orchestra of one instrument. That's one of our songs. We wrote it. This is the two of you. Three of us. That's my wife. I came to Christ one day and heard him clearly say, I died on Calvary that you might be set free. I'm glad all over. I'm glad all over. Since Jesus saved my soul, I'm glad all over. Since Jesus took control, he made me over. My heart he did set free, and now I serve him through all eternity. We, we are invited to churches, okay. but see, um, the, they invite the, you to come that's right, you that's right, a revival them. crusade, okay. that's right, and generally it would be scheduled for a week right. or 10 days, yep. and that was it, and that's what happened in Saskatoon. We were scheduled for 10 days at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in the city, Saskatoon, and that's the pastor. And by the way, Henry Blackaby was one praying with this pastor as well, the right. pastors in that city. And it was wonderful to see that happen. So they would invite us to come, and basically this pastor had heard about our ministry, heard that God was using it to minister to people's needs, and so he called... And there we are. Yeah. And so, and, but that's a whole nother story how God put the pieces together that we would go from one place to the next, next, even before this happened. And then when it happened, how a missionary home on furlough heard about us, said, when can you come to Alaska? When can you come to um, the Portland, Oregon area? When can you come to British Columbia? Right. And almost as if God was just putting the trail together without our having to try. Yeah. And you see, that's the, that's the supernatural element right. of it. It was not our having to promote ourselves. It's God having placed his hand on us for that specific ministry and then recognition of that by pastors elsewhere mm -hmm. to make the difference. Yeah. So when you got to North Dakota, so do you remember in North Dakota, do you remember this time? I remember, there? I remember being there. I remember the uh, kind of a pastor, Walter Trim, who was the pastor, right. a, a wonderful pastor. And I, I, I don't remember too much about the ladies, but I know that there were those ladies that influenced Bob right. and uh, had been influencing him even before we got there yeah. by their lifestyle and by their Christian testimony uh, to him. It was very real. Yeah. And then to, to see him coming with some of the others as well from his group, there were some others that came as well. Yeah. And uh, then to see uh, that hunger that God had created in his heart for something more, something more than just uh, merely going through religion. Yeah. And it's intriguing to see how in the midst of his Jewish background, you know, it, it was just wonderful to see how he grabbed a hold of the fact that Judaism is wonderful. It gives us the foundation for our blessed Savior, our Messiah, our Mashiach to come. And so we're not doing away with Judaism. We are just being completed Jews, fulfilled Jews, because we've found the Messiah, that which the prophets, the Jewish prophets prophesied. And to see how Bob was hungry enough to grab a hold of that truth and to recognize that the answer to his own personal needs 
were in Jesus Christ. And to, to sense how he was so enamored with a love for Christ and wanting to share it somehow, some way to, to have a ministry to others as well that opened the way for him then to have his own home. And that's a wonderful story, yeah. how God opened the doors for him to have his home and have other fellows there involved. And uh, I don't know if you saw, but um, I, I wrote a letter to his parents and to one of the other ladies that was involved with him and to just to let them know that basically you don't have to be afraid of this. He's just uh, now fallen in love with his Messiah and his life is going to be different from now on. Yeah. And, and it was marvelous to see how even though he feared what was going to happen with his parents, how God just softened their hearts and prepared them to receive him in such a way so that they knew that it was not something forced on him, but it was something God did. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. wonderful to see it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, and that's, it has to be an encouraging thing as somebody who's doing evangelism to know that, it, as you said, at least early on as you're doing evangelism, you're coming back to these places and the people are not there. So the goal of evangelism is not that people will pray a prayer and then go back to their lives. Yeah, the, right. the, the goal is that they'll be changed. Yes. And so it must be encouraging to have these types of people like Bob yes. in your life who it's, they weren't a believer and God used our mm -hmm. ministry to yes. not just bring this person to himself, but to completely See change that. him. Yes. And then to give him his own ministry. Yes. As it would be, I, I sometimes wonder about what heaven will be like, right? Yeah. And one of the things <laughs> I wonder about is, uh, is if we'll be able to see all of the ways that God used us. Yeah. You know, all the ways yes. that we don't get to see in this life. But, yes. you know, so I teach high school students. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have high school students who leave, they graduate, and I just wonder, did I say anything that they mm -hmm. actually heard? But maybe I won't see their fruit in this life, but I'll yes. see the fruit afterwards. But it's always encouraging when you do see that fruit. Yes. To have people like Bob. Yes, and, and I could tell, I don't want to give the impression that when we were doing evangelistic crusades it was not worthwhile. Right. Because because we saw many people's lives that were really changed. No question about that. Right. And there are lots of other people uh, apart from Bob's situation that their lives were completely revolutionized by the power of the gospel. And say, uh, but I, I think what's happened in in America is that the message has gotten so cheap and weak and anemic that it's uh, it's just what's in it for me. It's interesting, when Jimmy Carter was running for president that time, there was a lot of talk about the born-againers. And even some of the uh, magazines, Newsweek or Time, I forget which one, they ran a, an article. And the writer was very insightful when he said, that he noticed among the born againers that a lot of their what they're interested in is what's in it for them, how they can solve their marriage problems, how they can solve their nerve problems, how they can uh, get over some filthy habits. And it went on to say, but very little is being said or written about the lordship of Christ and his being in control of their lives, see? And I said, look, there's, a, there's a, a writer recognizing. And that's how God dealt with us about that. Yeah. Uh, so the message was deepened in our own lives and then in the ministry itself. And of course, and through the years, we've had a handful of people that have traveled with us. And now many of them have gone out on their own. We would, we would like the training for them right. to go out on their own, as well as people on the mission field mm -hmm. that uh, all, all around the world. Let me just tell you an interesting story about it. You talk about 
what, what produces revival. And you recognize it's prayer, it's prayer, it's intercessory prayer that really makes a difference. And, and you look at the average church. You know what we have? We have weekly prayer meetings, W-E-A-K-L-Y. W-E-A-K-L-Y. Instead of solid weekly prayer meetings that are solid. The, the hardest meeting to get people to come to is in the average church is a prayer meeting. Right. Now, I don't blame the people for it all. I blame many times the way we structure a meeting like that. It's amazing to see that. Um, along that very line, you know, it was um, um, Dr. Erwin Lutzer who told me and told us personally what it was like when he went to the Brooklyn Tabernacle, Jim Cimbala's big church in Brooklyn, where they have the prayer meeting. They had 3,000 people coming on a Tuesday night for a prayer meeting. And I'll never forget, um, he said, I went there to preach. And here he was pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago. He said to Jim Cimbala of the church, he said, how can you get 3,000 people in Brooklyn at night, Tuesday night, to come to a prayer meeting? And I'm in Chicago, and I can hardly get anybody who wants to really come back to the city for a prayer meeting. How do you do it? And Jim, Jim Cimbala turned to Erwin Lutzer. And he said, uh, why wouldn't you come if you knew God was going to answer your prayer? He said, we have believing believers. They expect God to answer prayer. And I've never had the opportunity of being there, but I've heard all kinds of stories. Here's a pastor in Eastern Canada telling me that they, he took a group of people from his church to the Brooklyn Tabernacle to their prayer meeting on a Tuesday night. He said he was told that if you want a seat for your prayer meeting, for that prayer meeting night, you've got to be there at least 45 minutes before the time starts. He said we were there at quarter to seven to get our seats. He said at seven o'clock they would have given the seats to somebody else. You better be there at least 45 minutes early. He said by the time we got there, 500 people on their knees already praying. A half hour before the prayer meeting even starts. 3,000 people on a Tuesday night in Brooklyn. Yeah. See? No wonder. No wonder he's seen so many people born again of God's spirit. Off of the streets, the drug addicts, the pimps, the alcoholics, everybody you can imagine. No wonder. A life like that. In prayer. Yeah. And so you see, that's what happened to churches. When God began to work in churches, well, when we were there in our meetings, we would have two prayer meetings a day. We'd have a prayer meeting from 12 to 1 every day. And from 6.30 to 7, a half hour before the evening service started. And so we'd have people praying. And it was wonderful to see how many times we would pray something at noon and the answer to the prayer was there that night. Mm -hmm. Something happening in the church service. And then we'd have youth prayer meetings going on. And sometimes some of the adults would be sitting around waiting for the youth prayer meeting to finish. And they said, here, here we are sitting around waiting for our teenagers. What's wrong with us? Right. And God was using that powerfully. And then, of course, whenever we would give an invitation for people to respond, we would then be in the prayer room with them. And it's interesting when we talk about this because God began to show us that you're not there to talk somebody into an experience. And we were used to seeing evangelism where when people would respond, here's a, they call them counselor, would come with notebook and pads and everything, all the information, and say, oh, now, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? How can I help you? And God began to show us, what are we saying to people? Here they've heard a message, and they heard that God, God, they heard God speak to them, and now 
they go to a place of prayer or come forward and somebody says, how can I help you? What can I do? Come sit, let me talk to you. No, God has done the talking. Don't get in the way. So in our ministry, when God worked in revival, God showed us that no, if you're calling people to respond to what God said, let them go to their knees. So we would have a prayer room, huge prayer room. We'd have chairs, uh, twos, 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 all the way around the prayer room. And we would say, you go to your knees and you respond to what God has said to you. And when you're finished talking to God, there will be a prayer partner next to you you can relate to when you're finished talking to God. And then we'd have the prayer partners there with the information. And then we'd have the prayer partners would say, say, share with me how God has spoken to you tonight. And then a decision card. You know, we used to have decision cards for salvation, for rededication, for this, for this, that, and you put a, an X in a box. No more of that. No, no. It's not just an X in a box. We would just have a statement at the bottom of our decision card said, on the back side of this card, write in your own words what the Lord has done for you tonight. Mm -hmm. And so they write. When they're finished praying, they write on the back side. And the prayer partner is informed. We train the prayer partner. Notice I didn't call him a counselor. Yep. I call him a prayer partner. See, if you say I want counselors, you, a lot of people won't show up because I'm, I'm not smart enough to be a counselor. Yeah. But if a prayer partner, I want a prayer partner, somebody who believes that God will answer prayer. And so we would have that prayer partner next to the individual say, uh, would you mind, share with me, Could, would you mind if I would read what you wrote on the card? And they would, and if it's nice and clear, fine. Then they'd go on with the material from there. If it's not, say, uh, tell me, is that all happened to you tonight or is there more? Share with me. And if it's not completely clear, that prayer partner then will take the scripture and say, maybe there's something we can share from the word of God that will help clarify what it is God's saying. Mm -hmm. See? And then when that's finished, then we'd have ever those people would sit in a big circle. This is in the prayer room. And I would oftentimes lead, in fact, I could possibly show you some pictures of that in an article that was taken in a, a periodical in Canada where you could see everybody sitting there and we're standing there and we would say, okay, now, now let's share together. Okay, how did God speak to you tonight? Share with us, share with us, share with us. Here we're a part of the body. It's not an individual act. You're a part of the body of Christ here. We, we are a part of each other. And we confirm what has happened. And sometimes if it's not clear, hey, how about if we put a chair in the middle of the room and say, why don't you kneel there and a few people will gather around you and let's pray that God will make this clear to you. And many times we'd be in the prayer room half the night praying with people like that. That's what made the difference. It's people meeting God, not just meeting a counselor, not just intellectually agreeing on something and meeting with God with expectation that he's listening absolutely that he answers prayers. absolutely now God doesn't always answer prayers the way we want him to no. right that's right right so what would you do in a situation if say you were in a prayer meeting and you prayed for something and say somebody was praying for their grandmother to get better and they came back the next time and said my grandmother's passed away has no. God answered that prayer he just answered it in a way that no no he didn't he's want no, you see, you're, you're off base as to the way we're praying. The, we are not praying for those things. Okay. We're just praying for our own we're individual praying. response to God. Okay. That's what it's all about, concentrating on our being filled with the Spirit, walking with God at a deeper level so that God 
we're, we're in a place where God can hear and answer our prayers. And that's where you were doing those prayer meetings. That's right. And that's then right. when they go out, but that would be a normal type of that's prayer. That's right. That somebody would have. But here you were just praying about. That's right. Their spiritual life. The, the spirit and submitting to God. Absolutely. So then when you go out, then you can absolutely. hear Absolutely. And you can follow. See, we're, we're, yeah, see, we're on praying terms and praying ground with God. Mm-hmm. Now that we have dealt with our sin, and you see, and the message became threefold. Deal with sins, surrender the rights of self in order to be filled with the Spirit. Sins, self, and Spirit. That combination coming together. Mm-hmm. And you see, and the average evangelistic crusade only primarily deals with sins. And no wonder there's such a fallout. Still, Self is in control. No sense of the, the spiritual end of it, the divine side of the power of the Holy Spirit to make this happen right. on a daily basis. Yeah. See? And God, that was God sharpening the message to the place that it became profound that people began to see, oh, how is it we've missed that truth for all these years? Combination of Romans 6, 7, and 8. All there. Yeah. Shall yeah. we shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Right. And then goes into that next ch- chapter about uh, the self, surrender, the death to the self. Right. And then in chapter 8, now the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Those who walk according to the Spirit, live according to the Spirit. That's right. Those according to the flesh. That's right. Are dead. You know? mm-hmm. And you see, and that's and that's been missing so much in the presentation of the gospel. That's the heart yeah. of the gospel. And that's what God used in revival. Well, let me get back to right. let me get back to Western Canada. There was a um, man who wrote the Danny Orlis series of books for boys and girls years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, here he was he heard what was happening in Canada and so he was he came up to see it later on a year later he goes down to south india and he's pre- preaching to the indians his na- to the um, to the uh, not, not the navigators so one of those groups or um, of men that gathered together okay so here he is telling them what he saw in western canada it's Bernard Palmer, the author of the Danny Orlis series, Books for Boys and Girls, okay. years ago. Okay? So here he is telling them what happened in Western Canada. And two, two of these uh, the guys, uh, the, the guys who have the Bibles, what are they called? The, the, the ones... The, the guys with the Bibles? Yeah, that's right. Anyhow. Oh, wow. But there they are. So two of these men come running up to him after he's finished talking about it. Yeah. They said to him, they said, uh, where did you say that happened? They said, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And they said, say it again. They wanted to make sure. Mm-hmm. And when they heard it again, they said, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's the city God laid on our hearts for a solid year before that we were praying for a revival to break out. And it was not till a year after it happened that they even knew what happened. Yeah. Prayers like that. Right. Okay? There's a historic context to this whole thing. And that is that uh, Duncan Campbell from the Hebrides revival was at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, speaking to that congregation. And here he's telling about what happened in the Hebrides years before, and that's in early 1900s, and it was just marvelous, okay? He could not get more than 50 people that would come out to hear him in that church. But while he was there, God supernaturally spoke to him and said to him that a revival was going to break out in Canada and it was going to start at that very church. 
And when he left the city of Saskatoon, he went to Winnipeg, where the pastor from Saskatoon had a brother. And here is Duncan Campbell telling his brother in Winnipeg that God has revealed to me a revival is going to start in Canada and it's going to start in your brother's church. And he said, you lock that in your heart. Lock that secret in your heart mm -hmm. until it happens. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And if you read the autobiography of Duncan Campbell, he lived long enough to see it happen. He died shortly after. And it's recorded. Mm -hmm. The very thing that I'm telling you. Yeah. So you see, when people say, is the, is the sovereignty of God involved in some of this? Absolutely. Is there anything that the sovereignty of God is not involved yes, in? Yes, okay. But in God's sovereign timing. Yeah. See? Yeah. He heads off it. And it was interesting because it was right at about that same time, revival was taking place in Kentucky at Asbury College mm -hmm. in the early 1970s. And that was beginning to spread to college campuses in, the, in our country. Same time this was happening in Canada. Mm. Almost as if God saw fit to pour out his spirit in unusual ways over that period of time. So do we say, can it happen again? Yes, it can if God in his sovereignty sees fit to do it. Right. But in the meantime, we are to set the sails for whenever God wants to send the wind. It's in God's hand. Right. And we can still put into motion the things we know are the things that will open the way and prepare the way for whatever God wants to do in his sovereignty. Yeah. And it's wonderful to live like that. Yeah. Yeah. It is. For sure, it's wonderful to live knowing that it's not up to us and our plans mm -hmm. and our timing because if it was, mm -hmm. then we're weak and those would ultimately fail. Yes. But it's up to God and He's mm -hmm. all knowing, all powerful. And so when it's up to Him, He can actually accomplish mm -hmm. what He wants to accomplish. Yes. If it was up to us, we would, we yes. would fail all over the place. Yes. Yeah. And of course, you see, when you think in terms of Bob, Cap Lewis's situation. Right. Just think sovereignty of God. Why, God certainly could heal anybody, right? Right. But you look at the ministry God gave Bob that he would have never had otherwise had he been like what we say, we say normal people, but I can tell you when I'm around people that have been, uh, you, uh, that have been put in situations that are difficult, I say, I wonder who the normal people really are. Some of those people learn how to love unconditionally and accept people the way they are. Whereas we have all our guards up as to who is nice and who is not nice. And we begin to see that, and you see how God uses that to impact people, especially when the Lord gets a hold of lives like that. Yeah. And it's wonderful to have seen that. And we've seen that in other people as well. Yeah. And it's wonderful. Yeah, so with Bob, there's so many there were so many things like that that were just constantly people around him were aware of. So Bob has cerebral palsy, and if he didn't have this, then we wouldn't know him. That's and right. If I hadn't known him and all the men that I know who worked with him, then we wouldn't have worked with him, which means that we wouldn't have had the chance to uh, care for somebody and to mm -hmm. learn to think of somebody before we thought of ourselves. And yeah. for a lot of these men, their testimony is that they worked with Bob maybe during their college years, and then uh -huh. they got married, and then they had children. Yes. They became a pastor, whatever it was. And always it goes back to, God used this in my life to prepare uh -huh. me. If, God, if, if Bob had just been healed, or if he just had not been born with cerebral palsy, yes. then all of our lives would not have been impacted Absolutely. in that way. Yeah. And the beauty of it, like you said, is that this was a ministry and Bob saw it as that. And so Bob yeah. Bob rested in the fact that God was sovereign. And so, well, God doesn't have this over here in my life, which maybe I would like. He has this for me. And so uh -huh. I'm going to live here 
Yes. I, I think it's kind of like what you were saying. As soon as I come in here, and you're telling me what you do here. Yes. It's like if this is not what you would have chosen. No. Fifteen years ago, this isn't what you were planning to do. Yes. But this is where God has you. Yes. And so you could either be discontent about it. Mm -hmm. You could give up and not do it. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, well, this is where God wants me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be here. I'm going to do whatever he wants me to do wherever he wants me to do it. Yeah, that's right. That's what you're doing. Yeah. That's what Bob did. And, and you see, that's a reminder that there's only one place of happiness that's in the center of God's will. Right. And whatever that is, right. whatever, whatever place he puts you, and, and, you know, and reading Bob's book about uh, not forgetting, not lose sight of my mind, but you cannot help but it was more than his mind that you can catch from the book. You catch his heart. You catch his spirit. You catch his love for people. You, you catch uh, uh, what intrigues me is transparent honesty and his openness even about his own failures. Right. Our change, it's a change of our direction. Whereas before we were living for self and sin, now it's a desire to live for God. It's a whole change of direction. It's a change of affections. Whereas my affections used to be on the things of the world. Now my affections are set on things above. Hmm. Right. And, it's, and all of that is a part of what St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now notice he didn't say everything is passed away. He said all things are passed away. Right. All things have become new. What's new? New direction. New affections. New interests. New desires. New goals. Yeah. Even in the midst of our humanness. And Bob has made it very clear, and you could see, in the midst of his writing, how he was not ashamed to say, hey, look, I failed here. Look, I failed there. But the grace of God was sufficient. I could go back to the cross, as it were. I could meet God on God's terms and have my fellowship restored in such a real way. Right. And that's, that's what's intriguing about him. Yeah. And even the, the little that we saw and knew of him, we could sense that that was his spirit. And also, in the midst of all that, Never lost a sense of humor. Never. See? And, uh, that's, uh, and some people think, oh, I don't want to live that kind of life. It's so dull, so boring. No, no, no. It's just the opposite. You don't, want, you, you don't know what real living is all about until you've been set free from the bondage of yourself right. in order to allow the, the life of God to flow through you yeah. and out of you. And it shows and wherever you go, some many times without having to say a word. People become consciously aware that there's somebody who walks with God. What a difference between that and mere religion. Yeah. And see, and we're around people who, who just, you know, they could talk about, oh, we go to church and oh, we take communion, we do this and that and the other. But you do not sense a heartbeat of love for God and a desire to walk with God and grow in grace. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, oh, I'm going to, I'll get to heaven because look, I'm a church member. Right. See? Yeah. And all that. And that's why the, the message of the cross and the message of death to the self-life and recognizing that we can't do it in our own strength, but only in the power of God, is so important. Let me just... Uh, Link on to that. Mm -hmm. When God saw fit to work in Western Canada like that, reporters came from all over the country to write up what this is all about. And I'll never forget how that um, one article came out and the author wrote something like this, trying to figure out what this is all about. Right. He went on to say, the music was below par. Okay? Right. Oh, well, we had Dr. Virgil Brock, who was our song leader. Now, that name may not be familiar with some, but when I say he's the, the man who wrote the song Beyond the Sunset, 
a song that's sung at many funerals. Beyond the sunset, O glorious morning, when with our loved ones who've gone before, in that fair homeland we'll know no parting, beyond the sunset forevermore. Uh, he wrote it at Winona Lake, Indiana, looking over the sunset. Okay. He was in his 90s, traveling with us as our song leader. He had a natural vibrato in his voice. He was never sure which note he was on singing. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and he's singing his own songs. He wrote over 500 songs. The first song he ever wrote in the 1930s was a song that you never hear anymore. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful savior to me. Beautiful song. That's the first song he wrote. It was a real hit song. But, but so here he is, and people told this article saying the music was below par. It was <laughs> way below par. And then went on to say the preaching was below par in both content and delivery. <laughs> Now, you, you put that together. It's below par in both content and delivery. Right. Well, just think. We had never been in a situation like that before. We'd never been in a seven and a half week crusade. You know, the first line sermons were gone. The second line sermons were gone. The third line sermons, you know. And, and, but at that point... Like I say, my brother was doing most of the nighttime preaching because I was involved with the operation of the whole crusade. Right. And I was doing the morning teaching sessions and the, the prayer room ministry. Okay? So I, I was going to have fun with that. I, when I saw that article, I say, came to my brother and I said, Lou, just look what they're saying about your preaching. <laughs> yeah. Look at that, look at that. Preaching below par in both content and delivery. But you know what the article went on to say? But one could not escape the fact that God was at work among his people. That's what the, that's the, what the rest of the paragraph yeah. said. And when I read that to my brother, I'll never forget the sight. His eyes as big as marbles and a great big smile on his face and he just bellowed out, Praise the Lord! It's about time something happened that nobody could get credit for it but God. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, that's, yeah. I would say, as you're saying this, yes. uh, that's, I would say that's a theme in Scripture. Yes. I mean, 1 Corinthians Paul, chapter 1. Apostle Paul talks about how yeah. proud of a speaker he is. Yeah. Moses does that. Moses yeah. asks God yeah. to get somebody else yeah. because of how bad he is. Yeah. And God seems to be in the business of using man's weakness. First Corinthians himself. chapter what? 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. I'm sure that's the chapter yeah. that talks all about it. Right. Yeah. God uses the weakness of man right. to bring to naught the wisdom of world. Exactly. And, and as you read through that chapter, that good to the end of it, why does he do that? Because it says it. So that no flesh could glory in God's presence. Right. See? So therefore, no flesh can glory. So that God alone is the only one that can get the glory right. for it. Exactly. See? So and, that's a beautiful message. Yeah. Here's a, another story that relates to the answer to prayer. Uh, an evangelist friend of ours was on a plane in Pennsylvania after this all happened. Mm -hmm. And he, there he was with a missionary sitting next to him. And he said, I'd like to know, can you share with me some specific answer to prayer that you've had in your life right. that you know is specific? And the missionary said, yes. I was praying and God laid on my heart to pray for the country of Canada that there would be a revival. And he said, then all at once, 
I heard that there were two little twins up there. Yeah. And a revival broke out. And I said, praise the Lord, God answered my prayer. And that evangelist wrote us about it. Another one is, and so if you would ask my brother, and maybe he'll tell you this, uh, you say, well, what is your definition of revival? Right. And he'll probably say something like this. It's when hidden springs spring forth. Springs underneath. Right. That the springs of people have prayed for years for revival. Spring forth. Let me share one more story like that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here we are when we were having evangelistic meetings. In Vernon, British Columbia, we're in a single church for a week. And there's an elderly couple there. And little did we know that God laid our ministry on that couple's hearts. And they prayed. They said, Lord, we're going to pray that God will change those fellows' ministry from straight preaching to the unsaved the way they've been doing to a revival ministry to the inner life of the church. Okay? Okay, when this happened, a short time later, we had a conference in Regina, Saskatchewan in February, in the middle of the winter. And here this elderly couple comes over the Canadian Rockies to this conference in the city of Regina with snow and cold, and they're all bundled up in the midst of it. And they come, and we had about 700 people there that came from all over the country for this weekend, okay? People who had met God in the meetings, and this is like a roundup. Right. Look, so here's this couple coming over. When my brother saw them one night on in in, uh, that weekend, he said, Mr. and Mrs. Fallis, would you come to the platform? I want to know why you came here from over the Canadian Rockies. And they're way up in years. And my brother, here's she's standing on the platform with him. And my brother says, isn't this wonderful to see what's happened? Isn't it wonderful to see what's happened? And she just looked kind of nonchalantly at him and said, this is nothing. This is nothing. And my brother, being an excited Italian the way he is, <laughs> he looked at it as if, what do you mean this is nothing? But he could sense she was saying something more. Mm -hmm. She said, this is nothing. And he said, what? And she said, this is nothing but God answering prayer, that's all. And she there tells the congregation that for four solid years, she and her husband were praying for our ministry every day that God would transform it into a ministry of revival to the inner life of the church. This is nothing. This is God answering prayer, that's all. See? On and on it goes. I could tell you all kinds of stories like that, yeah. confirming the fact that I'm not just sitting here talking to you just as another minister. Conscious awareness that God in his sovereignty saw fit to do it all. Right. Put us right there, right in the middle of it all. Yeah. And it's just wonderful to see it. And. You know, and I see some now missionaries coming home, some retiring now. I get a phone call just the other day from Regina, the head man there at the Canadian Revival Fellowship. And he say, hey, here's uh, the Evans. They've just come back from, uh, from Africa. They're retired. And he said, it's just so wonderful to see how God has used them over there in Niger. And then to sit here with them and to see the excitement in their lives and I'm wanting them to come and to move to Regina now that they're retiring because I want to use them here in ministry here. Mm -hmm. Lives, you know, they were farmers mm -hmm. in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Met the God in the Saskatoon Revival. 
And now they're retired from a fabulous ministry in Niger. Mm, on and on it goes like that. Yeah. One story after another. Yeah. Well, Amen. Amen. Well, if I could ask you one more question. Yes. And I think that this is, oh, this has been really sweet. Thank you um, for taking the time. I think the other, the other thing that I'm, I think that you could be helpful with to the work that I'm doing is this is what you've done because you believe that God was powerful and that God listens, right? Mm -hmm. So in just this one small, but obviously a big deal, in, in this one man's life, God used you in this man's life. I guess, what would you say to people? Um, how would you, just think about, I tried to follow what God wanted me to do, and over here, there's this result of that work. Maybe what would you encourage, what, what do you think people should do? The normal person. So maybe some people should go to Africa and become missionaries. Some people should become pastors. But what if you aren't supposed to become that? But what should everybody do? What would be the uh, call? You see, um, we are all called to be witnesses for Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the, the um, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, new creature. All things pass away; all things become new. Well, what follows that? That you've now become a testimony. You now become an ambassador for Christ. That you now speak in God's stead. So every believer has been given that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let me just pause long enough to say that Second Corinthians chapter five. 17 is often quoted but sometimes they forget to quote verse 15 and that he died they which live because he died should henceforth no more live unto themselves but live unto him who died for them and rose again therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature that's it. No more my life is no more my own. And it goes right into the fact that you're called, every believer is called to be an ambassador for Christ. So wherever you are, whatever place God's put you, you have a responsibility to be that ambassador. Whether even in your own home. I know in Beirut, Lebanon, we would sometimes go into the American embassy. <coughs> you know what was good about that? We could shut out Beirut and ah, oh, here we can get an American hamburger. <coughs> See, now we could get something like that. We, we're away from the, the, the people of their homeland, of their land, and now we're reminded of our homeland. So I want to get, what does an ambassador do? He uses his embassy to bring in people from the outside so he can influence them, let them see what, a, uh, what an American house looks like with the pictures on the wall, the kind of food that we eat. So if you're an ambassador for Christ, you don't own your house because no ambassador owns his own house. His homeland owns it. Right. His king owns it, whatever. Right. See? So if you're an ambassador for Christ, then you don't own your house. Now, you may pay the mortgage all right, but God gave you the ability to pay it, right? For sure, yeah. Okay? So it's his house. Right. What is there in your house that resembles your homeland? Right. When people walk into your house, do they get the feel that this, this is a house uh, that relates to a, a homeland that's different from what we live around us? And the music that's being played in your house. Whatever goes on in your house. What about bringing people in and let them feel what it's like to sit down at a table where believers can enjoy each other. Where you can have prayer. And by the way, even here where I am, I pray at every meal. Right. Everybody hears it. Yep. Loud enough so that people at the next few tables hear it as well. Yeah. 
Now, I don't purposely do it that way, but it's just that way because it is, it's, that's the way it is. Right. And so, you see, wherever, whatever sphere God placed you in, you have a responsibility to be his ambassador. And the tragedy is that even though we're ambassadors for Christ, if we do not represent our homeland but just represent ourselves alone, how are people going to understand what our homeland is all about? What our king is all about? And if we live in such a way that it's not pleasing to God, that shows the opposite. Who wants to be like that? If that's a Christian, who wants it? Hmm. And then if we're so dull and dry and dehydrated and disintegrated and refrigerated, you know, somebody said, you, you, well, that fellow must be a Christian. How do you know? Well, he has the same expression on his face as my mule has in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. How are they going to be attracted to Christ if they think we're dull and defeated and down at the mouth and always underneath it? We're ambassadors. We are representatives of our king. So whatever sphere, on the job, in the home, in the classroom, as young people, start young, start young. See, and we would often go to youth meetings. My brother would have the youth meetings. I would do the senior meetings and my brother did the youth meetings. Yeah. <laughs> he may tell you about that. Yeah. Ask, him about yeah. that. Ask him about that. Yeah. Yes. And he'll tell you, and what it was like to see young people on their knees, a whole congregation of young people on their knees, and then they get up and then share what God has done for them. Let him tell you about that. Yeah. It's wonderful to see it. Mm -hmm. And how they love to be in an atmosphere of revival. There's something attractive when God is alive. I'm like, oh, let me give you one more illustration about that. Yeah. Did I say one more, only one more a long time ago? You did. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a Bible college student in Winnipeg studying for the ministry. He comes home on a weekend. His town is about 45 minutes away from Winnipeg. He's coming home to be with his parents. And he sees the change that is taking place in the church and even among his parents. He came to me after doing that two weekends in a row. We were there for several weeks. He came to me and he said, Ralph, I've got to make a confession to you. He said, when I heard that you and your brother were coming here, I really was not interested. I figured it was just a waste of time, another set of meetings, and it's going to all be over. He said, uh, but I realize what a mistake. He said, what I've seen happen to my parents and what's happening to the people in this church, this has restored my faith in the power of Almighty God. He said, I had almost given up on ever believing to see the power of God at work in this church. This has restored my faith in the power of God. Now, you imagine that? Here's a fellow studying for the ministry, not even sure that God has power. Yeah. Can you imagine what kind of a ministry he could have on the outside? Had his faith not been restored in the power of God? Yeah. Yeah. It could be destructive. Absolutely. Life, so. Absolutely. And he can go through all the forms, and go through all the programs, everything he wants to do. Yeah. See? And that's what a revived heart does to a congregation and to a pastor. And it's wonderful to see pastors who've never been the same yeah. as a result of it. Yes. Yeah. That's sweet. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. It's been very sweet. I'm glad I got to come down here and meet you. <laughs> I'm glad of over Since Jesus saved my soul I'm glad all over since Jesus took control, he made me over, my heart he did set free.